Good afternoon. My talk today is on building surveys which were conducted in County Fermanagh this summer at five vernacular houses. This work was undertaken on behalf of the Locher Landscape Partnership uh, and was funded through the National Lottery Heritage Fund. It's quite a stark uh, situation we face with our vernacular buildings, particularly thatched vernacular buildings. Um, we're now in a situation where we have now more state care monuments in Northern Ireland than we have surviving thatched vernacular houses. One of the last few examples that we have, which has lived in the traditional manner, is my good friend Margaret Gallagher uh, and her little cottage at Molly Lusty in Belle Coo. And Margaret is still living the traditional lifestyle. Um, and in, 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 in many ways, this is you know, it's a fossilised way of life that is so uncommon to us today. But this was the, the, the standard that everybody lived to not that long ago. We're talking here really only 50, 60 years ago that people were living in these houses across Northern Ireland. One of the, the things that Margaret did uh, whenever Eileen and William Rolston were doing their, their book for Mana History and Society, she contributed an afterword, Reflections from the Bog Bank. And it is a fascinating uh, account of her life in her house and her philosophy as she goes about her daily life. So our vernacular buildings are at risk. And this slide here shows two books, Irish Cottages, which was um, Pfeiffer and Shaffrey in 1990, and Traditional Cottages in County Donegal by Gallagher and Stevenson in 2012. And you can see the same cottage uh, in any shown has been featured in both books. But you can see from 1990 to 2012, over that 20 year period, that that little cottage uh, is now in an uh, advanced state of uh, decline. Um, and it would be very interesting to see how it has fared over the last 10 years. Now, there's plenty of books and studies have been conducted on the vernacular architecture. Uh, you go back to Alan Gailey's Magnificent Rural Houses in the North of Ireland, uh, the Shaffrey's Irish Countryside Buildings, the Homeowner's Handbook that was produced uh, in 2004, and it continues right the way up through today to Marion McGarry and her The Irish Cottage and the associated book uh, on Irish customs and rituals, and Claudia Kinmouth's excellent Irish Country Furniture and Furnishings, which is a, a revamp of her book that she did in the 1990s and has just been published. So there's a, a, a very fine literature there about vernacular buildings. Increasingly, however, if you really want to interact with how our buildings looked and functioned uh, 100, 120 years ago, uh, you, the Ulster Folk Museum is really now one of two places that you can go within Northern Ireland. The other is the Ulster American uh, Folk Park. But the Ulster Folk Museum really was set up spearhead, spearheaded by two former students of Professor Eston Evans, uh, George Thompson and Alan Gailey. And it was established on 170 acres of land at Coltra in County Down, uh, which was acquired in 1961. Uh, and the idea was to illustrate what life was like in Ulster around about 1900. Uh, and it was became into to existence because there was a recognition that society was changing, that there was increased urbanisation, industrialisation, and a lot of these old houses were being abandoned, rapidly abandoned. So the idea of bringing these houses together and placing them in the folk museum it's very far sighted. You can see this process here. There's the, the Don Croon Cottier's house from near McGilligan, um, thought to be built around maybe about 1750. And you can see the house as it was uh, in very poor condition. It was then taken down and reconstructed uh, 
1961. It was a, the first building that was erected in the new museum. Uh, <clears throat> and you can actually see there, there's uh, Prime Minister Terence O'Neill uh, entering the, the, the property in 1961. So you have this process of bringing these buildings and placing them in the, the Folk Museum. One of the things I suppose that you're wanting to do whenever you study these buildings is to, to try and understand how they function and how they evolved over time. Because very often it's the case that a house isn't built and then just sits for the next 100, 200 years. If it survives, it'll be because it continues to have a function. It continues to have a requirement by the people who are living there. And this is a house that I worked at, Comiskey Cottage, outside Dromore in County Tyrone. And you can see that even a simple cottage such as this can hold quite an interesting story. You can see how this small uh, house, it commenced as a longhouse, a bar dwelling, probably in the 18th century. And then in the 19th century, it has a new unit added to the east end to replace that end of the bar dwelling. And then you have in the 20th century, additional dwelling space is created by moving back in to the remaining section of the bar dwelling and putting up a breeze block wall and incorporating that into the house as another bedroom. So you can see a long history right the way through from the 18th century through to the, the late 20th century at this property. And we can see that you know, this is part of the uh, the longhouse tradition. If you're wanting to, to understand better the, the longhouse tradition in, in the Northwest, uh, places like uh, Maharagalm, Fire Dwelling, at the Folk Museum. It's originally from County Donegal, but you can see this, the, a buyer dwelling here where you have at one end of the, the, the room, you have the fireplace and you have the area where the humans are residing. And then at the other end of the, the, the same building, you have the, the buyer element where the cattle would be. And the telltale signs are the fact that you have this drain running through the building. Um, and you also have the, the two doors opposite each other. So this brings us to the, the work of the Locker and Landscape Partnership. And um, one of the projects that we've been working with them on is vernacular heritage and vernacular architecture. And we have an online heritage campus, um, a virtual learning platform. Uh, and on that, we had a module on recording and surveying vernacular buildings. So the module was structured over four weeks, and it starts with you know, what is a vernacular building, week two, researching historic buildings, week three, going into the field, and then week four, writing your report. So that's very much the, the taught component. People have registered to signed up to come along week upon week upon week upon week and study these buildings and learn a bit more about the process of then recording them. And that's fine, but you need to actually show people how to go about recording. So the second element of the, the programme is the place-based learning. So we've done the online stuff, now we're actually going to go out in the field. And thankfully, uh, in August 2021, we were able to go back out and do some field work uh, following the whole COVID pandemic situation. So we had 11 participants who had completed the online campus uh, and they were a very well informed cohort and they brought that taught understanding and insight with them into the field. And we started and we went out and we surveyed the buildings, selected five buildings <coughs> across the thing that we were doing with this, these surveys was it was very low tech. This is not us going out with 3D laser scanners. This is us going out and doing a survey with pen and board and permatrace and tape measures and ruler. 
very basic. But the message we were trying to get across to the, the participants was that anybody can do this. The key thing is to try and understand the history of the building, if possible, but also how the building evolved over time. And the first building we did was the uh, McManus House um, in Bow. It's a lovely building. Uh, you can see a photograph there of it around about 1970 when it was still thatched. Uh, and it continued in, in, in use uh, as a home until the 1990s. It seems to belong to that period around the middle of the, the 19th century. And it's quite an, uh, a well set out uh, building. You've got two really uh, two spaces, two units in the, in the, the, the building. Uh, you have a living room area and then you have the parlour. Now, the living room area also has got partitioned, timber partitioned bedrooms, let's call them bedrooms, but they're, they're timber partitioned areas. And then above them, you had uh, half lofts. So there was space in there for the, the family to reside in. And then strangely, you had the parlour and nobody used the parlour and there was no uh, lofts in the parlour. Uh, so you have this sort of this use of the parlour, this important room in the house, which isn't used that much. The whole centre of activity in this house is the living room. That's the, 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 the heart of the house. And you can see there, one of something I'm going to pick up now is 16 feet in width. So we'll bear that in mind. When we move now up to not more near Derry Gonley and we go to the McGovern Cottage. It's a very simple building, um, but very nice. And it's in very good condition because back about 20 years ago, um, the owner did repairs. Now, they used breeze blocks and, and um, corrugated iron for the roof, but they rebuilt an awful lot of the, the, the damaged portions. And because of that, the building has survived quite well. You've got a two unit house, a living room, and again, this parlor. And you also then above that, you have got two attics. And that was the, the, the sleeping space. What's also interesting about this is <clears throat> the fact that the, the big uh, lintel over the rather delightful uh, chimney flue uh, has got a, a carving on it of the people who did the work, erected by P. Murphy and P. Cassidy Derry Gonley. Now, we don't know if it's that they erected that fireplace or if they actually erected the whole house. But you've still got that connection there with you know, names which are familiar in uh, the Derry Gonley area to this day. The house is marked on the 1834 Ordnance Survey, first edition, and on the subsequent editions. And you can see in 1860, you have this patchwork of properties that spiral out from the Clacham that the house belongs to. And you can see that it, it, it's, it belongs to uh, property eight, which is held by Stephen McManus, and the McManus family married the McGovern family. That's how it came into the, the McGovern uh, ownership today. Again, 16 feet in width. Now we move up to Marble Arch and we go to Leg Nabrocki. And you have this very long, thin building. Clearly, this is part of the longhouse tradition. And it looks as if this has been a buyer dwelling. It's there in the 1860s. It's owned by Hugh Johnson. Uh, and on his lands, he has a herd's house and land. There's evidence there that you had a really good quality limestone fireplace, similar to what we saw at the McGovern house. Uh, but there's also evidence that walls have been brought in and inserted into the building to divide up the space. So that one of these walls uh, that has enabled the whole lower section of the house to be transformed into a buyer. Whereas the, the other top end of the house, it has been divided with a wall which allows it to be a two unit house. So it's 47 feet in length and 16 feet in width. Now, you drive into the yard here to the Monaghan O'Connor house uh, at Scardens Upper near Balik, and you think you're just looking at a, a farmhouse. 
It's only whenever you actually go into the building that you realise this is another of these very thin buildings. It's another longhouse, but it's one that has had a long history of use again up into the 1990s because it was transformed over time into a two-storey house with a slated roof and then there was further renovations made to it uh, such as the porch being added. But fundamentally you're dealing with a long thin space and again later partitions brought in to divide up that space. And the dimensions 48 feet in length, 16 feet in width, which are very, very close to those of the herd's house at Legna Brocky. And then our final house is uh, Dunan's Cottage uh, near Cash. Now, it's had a long history. It's there in the 1834 First Edition Ordnance Survey. Uh, and in the 1860s, uh, it seems that the house was actually divided into two, that there's there's it's shared between Patrick Dunan and John McRae. If you look at the property today, it's clear that there's been a huge amount of work has been done over the years. It has changed its form quite a bit. There's been bits added on and bits taken away. You get a bit the best idea of the the, the original form of the building is its back wall. And you get the, the, the length of that original back wall, which is 46 feet. The width of the, the whole property is 17 feet. It's possible that what you're seeing there, where there's the, the breeze blocks and the, the, the what's a garage or was a garage, that that is actually the part of the property that was owned uh, by uh, John McRae. And the house was actually a longhouse which was then divided into two houses. So there's a lot going on there, and there's also some very nice architectural elements still in the property, such as these canopied bed stalls, two of them uh, in one of the, 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 the middle rooms in the property. So this was quite interesting because, you know, randomly we had gone out, we didn't know these buildings until we went out into the yards, farmyards and the fields, and started looking at them, we had just randomly selected five buildings, purely by chance. And our houses are numbers one, two, and five on the, the little map. But when you look at these, you have three houses which are all part of this longhouse tradition of the northwest of Ireland. And all three of them have seen change and development and then abandonment. And what's interesting is the fact that the external dimensions are so close. Legna Brocky, 47 feet by 16. The Monaghan O'Connor House, 48 feet by 16 feet. The Dunans Cottage, 46 feet by 17 feet. So is there some sort of underlying measurement at play here? It's possible. Uh, we know that an English perch is uh, 16 and a half feet in length. Uh, so these houses are very close to uh, an English perch. They're not close to an Irish perch, which is 21 feet in length, but they're very close to it. And you're looking at something that has a ratio. And the ratio really is three perches to one perch. And what's also interesting is when you look at the, the McManus and the McGovern houses, because they also have this perch, this 16 foot. OK, as I say, it's not the exact English perch of 16 and a half feet, but there's something going on here that you're seeing these houses, five houses randomly selected, and they are all having the same size. So that gives us plenty to, to keep us uh, pondering over as we move into season two and we'll be continuing with our surveys uh, in 2022 and at the moment we're compiling our list of sites to survey. So, thank you very much for listening to my talk.